was initially going to make this a response to Gear Up, but I think I've subjected my audience to more than enough Venom Fang X stomach churning drivel for one month. Instead, this is going to be a general rebuttal to some of the more common arguments against the legalization of induced abortions. Now let me start off by saying that if your first instinct is to link me to some videos or photographs of a bloodied aborted fetus, you will be doing nothing but appealing to emotion and grossing me out. I personally find the images of surgically induced abortions to be disgusting, but I also get sick to my stomach at the sight of most surgeries, and even live births. So, if you argue for a federal ban on induced abortions because you saw a video that made you want to vomit, then I have to dismiss you as someone who hasn't put much thought into this subject. If you object to induced abortions on a purely moral standpoint, then the solution for you is simple. Don't ever have one. But if you insist that your sense of morality should override the personal liberties of other people, you're going to have to provide a lot of evidence that something is inherently and unequivocally detrimental to society to the point that it must be prohibited by law. Another thing, I don't give a crap about which religion you follow, and neither does legislation. If you're someone who supports a federal ban on induced abortions because your holy book or your clergy told you to, then you don't belong in a country with a separation of church and state. May I suggest Afghanistan? There are a lot of groups out there. Do you agree with abortion? I am pro-life and I'm unapologetic. Pro-choice groups. I think life is at the conception. I do not agree with abortion. Abortion advocate groups. It begins at the moment of conception. Because uh, ever since a woman is pregnant, there's life. At the point of conception. It begins at conception. It's a, it's a fact. Life begins at conception. Of course there is life at conception. There was life prior to conception, when the two gametes from the parents fused together to create the new organism. And there was life prior to those two parents. And so on, and so on. So I don't contest that there is a life at conception. It just didn't begin at conception. You know, they send professors free copies of textbooks. So I just opened up one that they happened to send me. And it shows something quite different. It shows life as a cycle. And there's no start point here. Fertilization is one of the events going around uh, the cycle. This is the essence of sexual reproduction. We also know that there's asexual reproduction which doesn't have uh, this stuff at all. What anti-abortion people are really trying to say is that a fertilized egg is not only alive, and it is, but that it should be counted as a person. Which brings me to the next argument. Abortion is first degree murder. When you're not pricked in your heart when a human being is murdered. And why is the killing going on? Abortion is murder. That abortion is murder. Save the babies. The legal definition of first degree murder is the killing of a human being with intent, malice aforethought, which is the intention to kill, and with no legal excuse or authority. In order to bring about a charge of murder against someone who induces an abortion, one has to demonstrate that a person has been killed with malice aforethought. So what exactly defines a person? Let's start with an easier question. What is definitely not a person? This is a zygote, also known as a fertilized egg. If it has to be explained to you why this is not the equivalent of this, there is something fundamentally wrong with your brain, or you're just being dishonest. Okay, so maybe you're at a point where you're willing to concede that a zygote is not a person. Well, as the zygote starts making its way into the uterus, it divides over and over again through mitosis, about five days later, it becomes a blastocyst, which is just a cluster of cells. Does this look like a person to you? Eventually, the cluster of cells attaches itself to the uterine wall and continues to divide until it becomes a multicellular eukaryote called an embryo. If your next breath is used to declare that this is a person, yep, you'd be wrong. This isn't even a human embryo. This bundle of joy was conceived by two pigs. Here are four more animal embryos. Can you spot the person? Okay, okay, so an embryo is not a person. But what about a fetus? I would have to say that that depends. Because this is a fetus, but then so is this. One is clearly not viable, 
while the other is ready to pop out at any moment. If you're honest enough, then you can figure it out for yourself. If you intend to make a case that induced abortions are the equivalent of murder, then what you are saying is that a developing human is a person and that the death of one by another is a homicide. In which case, you have to then address spontaneous abortions, especially when they occur due to the woman's carelessness or unhealthy behavior. What sort of homicide should those be classified under? Negligent homicide? And what sort of criminal action should the state or federal government take against women who get induced abortions? Should they actually be charged with murder? And if a developing human is a person, then they have to be accounted for like everyone else. Should we require them all to have names? Will we start issuing every zygote a social security number and every abortion, spontaneous or otherwise, a death certificate? Will we start counting them in the census? What makes the abortion as murder argument all the more troublesome is how it allows absolutely no room for exception. By its very definition, murder can never be justified. If you do believe that there can be exceptions to a ban on induced abortions, then you can't say that it is the equivalent of murder. Typically, only a few anti-abortion people will come right out and say that induced abortions should never be allowed for any reason, including in the cases of rape, incest, or to save the woman's life. And then they have the audacity to call pro-choice advocates evil. Well, listen, if you're raped... Rape is among the most violent and vile and devastating of sins but that doesn't give you the right to abort your baby. Get the balls to carry the child for nine months. They give their unborn baby a death penalty because the father is a rapist. Let's not make the child a victim. I find the people who make statements like this to be complete cowards. While they are so quick to condemn abortion practitioners, they totally dance around the fact that they are in favor of punishing victims of sexual abuse. If you are also in favor of this, you can pretty much kiss the whole abortion is psychologically damaging excuse right out of the window. There aren't many things that are worse than having your body violated, but to be constantly reminded of it every single day because of a pregnancy and the offspring that results from it has got to be far more emotionally painful than having the pregnancy terminated. Please, tell your wife or your mother or your sister, or your daughter, that while you would sympathize with their horrible experience, you would be in favor of taking away their right to terminate a pregnancy that resulted from rape or incest. And while you're at it, tell them that you would rather they die than to terminate a pregnancy that is literally killing them. The argument is interesting to say the least. Health for the mother. This would be my option. But the reality of modern medicine and the current situations we live in... And you know that's been stretched by the pro-abortion movement in America to mean almost anything. Even if it was, even if a large number of women were to die in birth... Wait it out. There are circumstances when allowing a pregnancy to progress puts the woman's life at risk. Now, I can think of a number of names that would be most appropriate for people who deny or scoff at these circumstances. But pro-life is definitely not one of them. They have forgotten that even a normal pregnancy can pose serious health risks to the woman. Preeclampsia, gestational diabetes, bacterial vaginosis, routine urinary tract infections. And then there are complications that will kill both the woman and the developing embryo or fetus. Ectopic pregnancies, heterotopic pregnancies, Valentine syndrome, also called maternal mirror syndrome. These are medical emergencies in which case induced abortion is not an elective. It's a necessary medical procedure. And what about women who become too pregnant? In vitro fertilization involves transferring several embryos into a woman's uterus to strengthen the chances of successful implantation. This can result in multiple implantations. Normally, the doctor will give the woman the option to employ selective reduction, but in certain cases, selective reduction is absolutely necessary, despite the recent unethical acrobatics of the octopus lady. Whether you like it or not, sometimes pregnancy is deadly. But all is not lost. There is one thing that both sides can agree on. We all want the number of induced abortions to be reduced. Now, one side insists that proper education and the use of contraception can reduce the number of unwanted pregnancies. The other side not only wants a federal ban on induced abortions, but very often takes the stand against sex education and the promotion of contraception. Now, does that make any sense? 
It sounds like a bunch of people living in fantasy land where making something illegal makes it go away forever. Well, if the current prohibition of prostitution and recreational drugs has been any kind of an example, you should know by now that passing laws to restrict people's rights to control their own bodies never works.